Well, this evening we're going to talk about extraordinary events in our time. And before I start, I think I would like to make an appeal to my Protestant brethren out there in the world that we are living in very, very serious times. And I believe that they are complacently walking towards a precipice and don't really take cognizance of the situation as it really is. And uh, we need to look at some of the issues because today everybody is in an ecumenical mind. Everybody thinks and believes that everybody is coming together and this will bring about an era of peace. Well, the Bible tells us when they say peace, peace, there will be sudden destruction. Now, what is the issue and why will there be sudden destruction? This is what we have to understand. Because what seems to be so congenial on the outside could just contain the sting of death. And that is what we have to discuss. And I know that people know that I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And they think, because he's a Seventh-day Adventist, he's sitting in that sectarian little group there on the one side, thinking that he's holier or they are holier than anyone else. No, we are more pathetic than anyone else. Don't get the idea that we are fancy or better than anyone else. But there is one difference. We have been instructed with a particular message of warning. And this warning goes to the whole world and to the Protestant world in particular. So this is an appeal to the Protestant world. Will you look at your roots? Will you look at those issues which made you Protestants in the first place? What was the protest about? Has the protest been resolved after Vatican II? Or has it actually been intensified but nobody sees it because of deception? And that is the question I want to ask my Protestant brethren. I'm of German stock. I still speak the language poorly, but I still speak it. My mother was a Lutheran. And if you think back in history, the price they paid for what they believed and where they are heading now, I think it is time that they, in spite of the fact that they think that we might be strange people, look at this, just look at it and make a decision based on the facts and not on the feelings. The Protestant world today does not believe what the Protestant world used to believe. The Protestant world today has incorporated the doctrines of Rome. They have discarded their doctrines in terms of the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 13. Everything they stood for, everything they wrote, they have discarded. And in the place thereof, they have adopted Jesuit doctrines. Now this should send alarm bells ringing throughout the world. And the evangelical world, to a great degree, has accepted dispensationalism, which is just an expansion of a Jesuit doctrine. It is to take the heat off the very target of the prophecies of the Bible. Now... This year is a fascinating year, 2015, because there will be many events taking place, and many people are very fascinated about the events that will take place this year, and there are many predictions as to massive disasters at the end of this year, be they economical, be they natural disasters. Some even believe that, a, that an asteroid will strike this earth, and there are all kinds of conjectures. Just look at the Bible. Just study the prophecies, and none of us need, need to run to and fro looking for answers, because they've all been provided. They were all understood, but they've been rejected, and therefore 
there's this vagueness in the world today. Well, next year has been declared a jubilee of mercy, an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. And uh, we, have to, we have to understand the context in which these people move and how they function. We've discussed many issues around numerology and around how Gnosticism works. These people are steeped in numerology. It is part of the cabal. They will not move without it. And they don't mind if this leaks and people become interested and look at all these dates and expect wonderful things to happen on a specific date here and a specific date there. If they want their calendar, their Kabbalistic calendar, and want to operate according to their calendar, even plan details of destructions and wars and calamities according to their calendar, what is that to God's people? Don't we have the Word of God? Isn't that our information basis? Isn't that what we base our doctrines and our understanding on? Why do we have this shift from the Word of God to an occult agenda, which might be fulfilled to the letter, but wouldn't add one iota to biblical prophecy? So, take cognizance, it's interesting. Let me say, vaguely interesting. To them, it's everything. To me, it's pathetic. Because, well, sorry, I perhaps shouldn't say it so harshly. But to base your entire life on a number here and a number there, and whether this thing is written this way around or that way around, or whether there's this name or that name, is silliness. God is concerned about character development on this planet, and God is concerned about salvational issues, not whether we get the numbers right. But that doesn't mean that we have to ignore what these people do. It's, it's worthy to look at it, and uh, it can put things into a framework, but we shouldn't be hung up on it. The Holy Year of Mercy, and the way they put it out, this is the official Vatican network, newsvatican.va, news.va, and you can see how, how they portray themselves, the image that they portray. The Pope kneeling there at the confessional and receiving absolution. This is, this is an image that is brought across of a humility and uh, you know, an ambiance that is created for everybody to say, but this is a holy man. And he's called the Holy Father by the highest people on the planet. Call no one father, says the Bible. That doesn't mean your earthly father. But in terms of spiritual things, we have one father, and that is our God in heaven, and there's none other than that. Anything else is idolatry. And to call a human being holy is presumption of the highest order. Well, here is his ball. An extraordinary jubilee of mercy, which has been promulgated for next year. Now, let's have a look at this. At times we are called to gaze even more attentively on mercy, so that we may become a more effective sign of the Father's action in our lives. For this reason I have proclaimed an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. Now, when it comes to jubilees, the Kabbalists become very excited. Their knees start shaking and they get all kinds of emotional feelings as a consequence. And if you have a jubilee of jubilees, well, well that's extraordinary. If you should have a jubilee of jubilee of jubilees, well, then you might just as well have a cadenza because then there are so many fortuitous Kabbalistic things that come into harmony with each other, that you can probably move a planet if you have to. So this is an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. And if they start saying the word jubilee, then it's always a 50th year of commemoration of something or some event. 
and they plan everything according to a liturgy. And if it falls then within the ambience of a jubilee, even so much better. The extraordinary jubilee of mercy at a special time for the church. A time when the witness of believers might grow stronger and more effective. The holy year, it's a holy year, will open on 8 December 2015. That's the end of this year. Now, just, just a thought. The Pope has the power to declare a holy year. The Pope has the power to declare an extraordinary jubilee. The Pope has the power at such an uh, injunction or any other injunction to declare an indulgence. Now an indulgence, as you all know, is relief from the punishment of sins already forgiven. Now I know I've explained this many times, but it doesn't seem as though Protestants get it. I don't think they get it. What started the Reformation? What was the trigger that started it? Indulgences. Indulgences. Martin Luther says, excuse me, what's going on here? This is not biblical. And uh, it started the whole Reformation as we know it. Martin Luther's theses that he put against the church door, all of them only dealt with indulgences. There was no issue of the other things. He hadn't thought about them, about all the other doctrinal errors. It was only about indulgences. Next, in Catholic thinking, when you have been forgiven your sins, then that's one thing. But you have not been relieved then of the punishment due to those sins. So this is what an indulgence is. And an indulgence is a grace handed to the church. And the Pope can take from the merit of Jesus Christ and all the saints that went before and apply that merit to those who don't deserve it because they have sinned grievously in their lives and thereby give them relief from the punishment due. Now if it were a kind man, I always say, I would give relief every morning and every evening so that no one has to suffer on the other day. But why wait 50 years or 25 years or whatever their cycle is to let people suffer if you have the power to relieve them. The interesting thing is, Jesus does not have the power because apparently he's relinquished it to the church. And in any case, what kind of notion is it to say that you still have to pun be punished for sins already forgiven? Now, let's say I did something wrong and I was grievously nasty to my wife. I never do anything like that, of course. And I go to her and I say, you know what, I'm terribly sorry. I'm the meanest son of, the, of a gun on the planet. Can you forgive me for what I did to you? And she says, sure, I'll forgive you. And we hug and we make up. And the next thing I get a blow from a cake roller over my head that I stagger. I say, what was that for? I forgave you, but I'm just giving you the punishment due to your sin. How well would that go down with me? It's pathetic. It's a denial of the absolute sufficiency of the forgiveness the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is an affront to the God of heaven who paid the price to come down to this earth to pay the price in toto. It is by grace that you are saved. If you have to still suffer the consequences and pay the price, in the afterlife, not here, in the afterlife, 
when you get to the other side, you can't go to heaven, you must first go to purgatory, which doesn't exist in the Bible anyway. Then there's something wrong 